This podcast is brought to you by Always Possible. Alwayspossible.co.uk Some say that if we sorted out the housing crisis in the UK, then everything else would become easier. Others say that if we changed one thing, it should be social care and the way we fund and support the lives of those who can't live independently. But perhaps it's both. And then maybe we'd have a functioning NHS, resilient households, consumer confidence, robust pensions, a bigger workforce, a reduction in systemic inequality. Maybe. But these are knotty problems, or as some call them, wicked problems. Too complex to solve, there's no money in it. Certainly not something for businesses to get tangled up with. Well, in this episode of The Possibility Club, we're shining a light on a company that leans into both. A company that takes the role of landlord and developer, finding and maintaining housing stock. But it is housing stock for people who have care needs and who want to have a high quality of life that needs some adjustments and some compassionate understanding and a team of professionals around them. What kind of business mindset would develop a mission like this in a space that others just simply run away from? Well, I'm Richard Freeman. And I'm curious about brave decision-making in practice and in business. And my guest this week has a vision for a world in which everyone with a learning disability has good housing and has their needs met. He runs one of the largest community benefit societies in the UK with a portfolio of over 1,200 properties and over 2,000 tenants with a wide range of needs. Please meet the Chief Executive of Golden Lane Housing, John Verge. Welcome to the Possibility Club. Uh, it's me, Richard Freeman, here talking about practical bravery, talking about change, disruption, leadership, impact, as usual. And guess what? I've got a really interesting guest with me yet again. It's like you know the drill so far. Uh, nothing much changes here apart from the insights and the observations. And this episode, we are looking at the messy, complex, wonderful, inspiring, challenging world of housing. And I'm delighted to be joined by John Verge, Chief Executive of Golden Lane Housing. John, how the devil are you on this sunny Wednesday, May morning? I'm very well. I'm here in a sunny Taunton uh, in Somerset, down in the southwest of England. Nice to see you, Richard. What a, what a glorious place to be. But just be- just before we started recording, you're saying you're doing a lot of travelling at the moment. So do you, your work takes you all around the UK. Yes, we're a national housing association, uh, predominantly England, uh, although we do also have uh, tenants who live in Wales and Northern Ireland. But uh, yes, all all over. And it's been particularly enjoyable since we've come out of the various lockdowns over the last couple of years to actually get back out um, on the road, on the trains, uh, to actually meet our tenants, staff and uh, other organisations and government uh, uh, people that we work with. So yeah, no, great, great to be out uh, seeing people. But I also, obviously, as we all do, spend a lot of time uh, on the screens and uh, talking yeah. to people on the phone as well. Yes, what a strange new world we're in. When we talk about housing, there's so many different stakeholders. There is a big housing crisis in the UK and and the response to it is has been mixed success, shall we say, I think, over the last few years. Um, but then other people might think of it in terms of 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 social housing and of opportunities for people to to build and live independent lives where maybe that's not always quite so easy but tell me in the whole mix and in the kind of housing landscape where do golden lane sit what is it that you do what's the kind of driver of of your organization you're certainly right richard that that housing is a is a major topic as i think it's the second or third most important topic for i think for under 25s now in terms of kind of that political agenda and for people with learning disabilities and autistic people who uh, we've been able to support into community-based supported living over the last 25 years. Um, we've been uh, uh, going for 25 years. We were set up by the charity Mencap mm-hmm. uh, to provide housing for people in their communities, at the heart of their communities. And the challenges that people with learning disabilities and autistic people have are both the same, and I would say even more so than most people currently living in the UK. And the choices and the availability of accommodation 
uh, is limited. But organisations like ourselves and other organisations who work across the, both the housing association and, and uh, charity sector have been doing a fantastic work, uh, working alongside local government, um, local support providers to actually provide that accommodation. But certainly, as with any type of housing, demand is currently outstripping the uh, provision. But we're, we're doing a lot of work and we've done a lot of work to, to try and improve um, the choices out there. So when I, I started, I started with Golden Lane Housing 23 years ago now when government policy was very much about supporting people with a learned disability and autistic people into homes in their communities, living in ordinary houses and ordinary streets, moving away from institutions. So 30, 40 years ago, most people with a learned disability were living in either very large institutions or actually in hospital settings. Mm -hmm. And there was, uh, you may have remember the care in the community in the mid nineties, a very, mm -hmm. very clear steer from um, the government to to provide community based settings. So we kind of started at that at that stage. Um, very limited government grant funding available at that time, and and frankly, there still is. And I'm sure we'll come, get on to some of the the changes that that we've um, been advocating for in recent years to to change that. But a lot of the accommodation that we provided over the last 25 years has been with private finance through money we've borrowed. We've done um, retail charity bonds. We've been you know sort of um, uh, linking in with um, social investors who who want to see a difference uh, with the money they invest. Um, we ha have managed to get some health and NHS England grant funding um, to, to buy houses. Um, and we also look at other arrangements. So we work with other housing associations and local authorities to maybe lease properties and, and make sure that they're fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, we currently have around 2,700 tenants across uh, the country or with support a lot of our tenants have high levels of support um but it, that support and the right environment gives them the opportunity to live the best lives you know certainly compared to what was on offer 20 30 40 years ago um it's just transformational and, and i guess the, the i guess the other reflection that i would have in the last 25 years in the work that i've been involved with is is that very much linking with families for every individual that we house, they will have a circle of support, a network. They'll have mum and dad, brothers and sisters, friends. So the, the worry and the concern that they have around the future of their loved ones when um, either they're not around or they're not able to support them in their own home, being able to offer accommodation, you know, provides that, uh, in a sense, mental health well-being for them as well, as well. Sadly, though, even over the last 20 years, the same proportion of people with a learning disability are probably still living at home than they did before. We're seeing an increased number of people with a learning disability. Um, people are living longer, not as long as they should be. MENCAP have been doing a lot of work in terms of um, health campaigning and, and making sure that doctors and nurses get the appropriate training. But people are living longer. Um, therefore, the demand for supported housing, which is predominantly what uh, local authorities want to commission now, and that's where someone has their own tenancy, and their support and care is provided normally by another organization. So they have that choice of control. Mm -hmm. um, there are some still um, people living in care homes, but that, that's reducing. But still a significant, nearly 40% of people who actually even receive care and support funding from their local authority are still living with uh, elder carers. They tend right. to be mum and dad. You are the landlord, aren't you, essentially? So it's 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 being commissioned to to... to to buy up property, to manage and maintain property? Do you do you build any? Oh, all of that, yes. So <laughs> so the starting point is we'll be talking to an individual, their family, uh, the local authority, the health authority about what, what is needed. Um, it's always got to be commissioned because mm -hmm. critically everybody will need a support package that's paid and that's off, That's the other issue that we have to make sure that that, their mon that money is available. But yeah, we'll, we'll look at the options. If if clearly we've got existing accommodation that matches the need, then we, we would obviously look to house them in them, uh, those accommodation. But uh, predominantly, it's, it's setting up new schemes. Yeah, um, we do do new build, but I guess the the reality of of commissioning in this country is very reactive. One yeah. of the things that we and, and certainly the government have been talking about more recently is is more strategic planning for uh, local authorities and health authorities to better plan strategically. But often, you know, we're being approached to house people very quickly. And, and when I say very quickly, that could be three 
to nine months. But if you're doing a new build development, that can take anywhere to three to five years to, to identify a site, get the funding and then build it and then develop it. Uh, and we do some of that and we work with some local authorities who, who do that uh, and we lease that accommodation from them. But a lot of the accommodation we have to provide very quickly, which tends to mean we tend to buy existing properties but they need to be in the right location where people feel safe and, and close to their family and, and friends and, and, and community settings. So not isolated, mm -hmm. certainly not on a kind of industrial estate or in the middle of uh, uh, sort of a, uh, the country. So there's you know, to be access to community settings and often finding those right properties is difficult. But when we find the right property, often it means doing major renovations, adaptations, improvements, make sure that, that the quality is right from day one, but make sure that the environment is right so people can live in a property if they have higher wear and tear on a property, that we make it robust. So this is about enabling them to be appropriately supported in their own home, but have the right environment to, for them to thrive. Sometimes that might mean a detached property. So if, they, so if a tenant is going to make noise, we don't want to control that noise. We want to support them obviously be mindful of any impact on neighbours. Again, with adaptations, some of it will be around uh, physical disability. So a uh, number of our tenants will also have mobility disabilities as well as, as learning disabilities or autism. Uh, and, and sometimes we're not need to make sure it's adapted for, for people in uh, perhaps who use wheelchairs, but we'll also adapt it around uh, people's uh, emotional and behavioural needs. So that could be specialist kitchens, bathrooms, make sure it's safe, secure. Um, and then once we've developed a scheme, someone's, you know, an individual's moved in, uh, or sometimes they want to share with other people, they move in. And then we've got a specialist team who provide that specialist management service, maintenance service. We we have a team of really dedicated housing officers who who make sure that well-being and safeguarding is at the, is at the forefront of our work. We lay very closely with those care and support providers who will be in providing the care and support mm -hmm. um, often 24 hours a day sometimes we'll have uh, staff who sleep in the property that's quite common so there'll be additional bedrooms for for them but it's very much you would walk into uh, properties that we provide and, and other organizations in the sector it's got to feel like anybody's home and how far do you think the general public understand the setup, you know, I think what you're talking about and describing is, is not a small operation. No. I wonder if if the general public, you know, to speak in slightly homogenous terms, but 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 really understand that this is, you know, a genuinely impactful thing that's happening. Because I just on the on on, on taking my son to school this morning on the radio, there was a debate about the private rental market and about yeah. the the um some of the new bills going through Parliament and you had lots of landlords saying, well, this just makes it impossible for us to do what we do. You know, last week the stories about mold in, in social housing. So, you know, the media seems to be kind of relentlessly full of very negative stories about the sort of broken relationship between landlords and tenants now often that's uh it's right because there are lots of abuses happening within the private rental market and it's a, a landlord's market sort of at the moment but do you get do you get thrown in with that do you think that there's not enough counter stories to actually talk about the sort of work that you're doing uh yeah there's definitely not enough of that and we we, we uh, have been trying to do more and more of that um i've been picking up your comment about the private rental sector it's an area that we've been focusing on for the last 15 years around the number of people with disability who haven't been able to access the private rent sector but for different reasons and frankly i think the new private sector reforms uh, around abolishing section 21 notices which is no fault evictions is probably going to make people both in terms of on benefits and perhaps people who are perceived by landlords as as more difficult to deal with even more increasingly difficult for people with learning disabilities and autistic people to access uh, the private rental sector themselves directly and that's why we have done a lot of work actually being the broker initially sorry so just to... so just on that point so that's really interesting you're saying because of the the scrapping of section 21 which on the surface should be a good thing because it's getting rid of no fault evictions you're saying landlords will then just not yeah i think for the general population there'll, there'll be nervousness anyway i think that yeah. the scrutiny uh of new tenants going will be even greater than 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 now um interestingly the new reforms will provide penalties for letting agents and landlords who penalize people who are on benefits they should they shouldn't be able to certainly advertise 
you know, I think the, the old phrase, it probably goes back 30 years now, no DSS and, and yeah, sort yeah, of, you know, yeah. no housing benefit, no local housing allowance, uh, basically, because that's if you're a private uh, tenant, that's that's what you would be claiming. And, and as we know, since 2018, 2019, that local housing allowance hasn't been increased. So it's not caught up even even if rents were going up as they perhaps did a few years ago, let alone the, the last year that we've seen rents just go up astronomically. But for people who learn disabilities, I don't think they're going to be as blatant as saying we we're going we're not going to house you because you've got a learning disability or you're or you're on benefit. Well, that would that would be illegal. But well, that would be illegal. But and and even the Equality Act, and we we can we can yeah. quote the Equality Act now. But I think you know, letting agents like landlords will, will be clever enough to just exactly. they will have a, a selection process to do They'll that. Find other that's, ways. So that's why I mean, we we actually got some government grant funding back in 2010 to do a a, a service in Southwest London with the seven. Uh, London boroughs to actually help people through letting agents get uh, into the private rent sector. It was very difficult even then. Uh, so, so what we created was a was a product and a solution where we took the lease directly from the landlord, and then we uh, have got the ability under that lease to sublet it to people with disabilities, either individually or maybe a group of people, and that's worked really, really well. And what we're trying to do now is actually find landlords who are not just prepared to lease it to a, for us for twelve months or three years but a longer term arrangement so so i think i think we can respond to some of the challenges in the sector and we are doing that but i think you know look at the wider picture for people learning disabilities you know there's 1.1 million adults with a learning disability and 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 probably at least 350,000 people with autism they live in all everybody's communities mm. now of those you know 1.4 million people 1.5 million people around about 150,000 of those will re- receive some form of support funding from local government or or their health authority uh and that comes at a 6 billion pound cost to the the treasury so th- this isn't a small niche part of both the social care and health sector we've got a report coming out shortly that shows there's about 35 to 38,000 people currently in supported housing so and that that number is is projected to increase by at least 1800 to 2000 per year over the next 15 years this podcast is brought to you by always possible but who are we always possible works with ambitious businesses charities and public services that are thinking about what's next From architects to aerospace companies, puppet theatres to primary schools, business networks to big data analysts. If you're wanting to be brave with some big decisions or to be clearer about what to prioritise, then an award-winning workshop from the Always Possible team is a brilliant starting point. We care about just one thing, building ideas that work. For creative, intuitive and practical expertise, consider Always Possible as your strategic partner. To find out more about how we could power up your mission, visit alwayspossible.co.uk. Alwayspossible.co.uk. Every town, every city will increasingly see people with a learning disability live in their communities. And when I visit tenants, you know, one of the first things I say is, you know, how are your neighbours? And, and and most times they'll say, yeah, we you know, they'll pop round and um, bring us cakes or we, we get the Christmas card. You know, doesn't mean necessarily have to be a best friend, but you know, not every neighbour has to be a best friend. But it's being part of the community. So I think, I think we just want to make sure that everybody learns, but has the same opportunities. Whether that's renting from a from a housing association, whether that's actually living a property that you own, and we work with a lot of families and trusts to enable people to remain in the family home. Uh, for example, if mum and dad pass away or or can no longer support them in the home, options for people to live. In, in the family home going forward. Um, interesting, one of the things um, our upcoming research uh, will show is that there is a um, increasing number of uh, people with learning disabilities and autistic people living in mainstream, uh, predominantly social housing. And that's gone up to around about 23% of that 151,000 people receiving care and support. And they're living in sort of general needs, what's called mainstream social housing. and. When I talk to um, housing associations, perhaps who don't specialise in housing for people with disability, they're telling me that increasingly they're getting more and more people in their accommodation that don't get any support uh, mm-hmm. or limited support 
and that's putting pressure on them. And interestingly, the housing ombudsman, who again is um, really focusing on the quality in social housing at the moment, and, you know, the, the damp issues you just referred to, and and the terrible case in Rochdale last year, highlighting the case that a lot of uh, failures are down to housing associations not taking into account the vulnerability of their tenants. And actually, there's a starting a blurring of the lines between social housing and supported housing mm -hmm. and i think the reason for that is and what we're seeing over the last certainly the last 10 years with austerity is we're getting people referred to us who are at the most complex uh, end of the, the spectrum of, of need and support that's partly because that's where the the care funding is and for those people with low and moderate support needs um people who've got a learning disability still need support but they're not getting that any longer they're often getting accommodation through their local uh, authority or their housing association. So, so I think the conversation we're having with governments, with our peers, we, we work very closely with our other housing associations, is, is very much say, yes, there's issues for our part of the, the niche, you know, specialist uh, uh, supported housing sector, but actually it's much wider than that. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm being invited to more housing conferences, national housing conferences to talk about this issue. And there's much more interest than maybe even there would have been two or three years ago. And um, four years ago, I, uh, along with a number of other housing associations, set up a, a network and a coalition of of housing associations who, who work to house people with learning disabilities. Some very large housing associations, some of the largest in the country, through to some of the smallest, more specialists. Um, and the research that I've re just referred to comes out this summer. Uh, it's got some clear recommendations for government. And we really think that the social impact, both in terms of the impact it has on people's lives and their families, is fantastic and great, but also the, the cost to the public purse. This is, this, you know, yes, it's expensive to provide specialist accommodation for people with disabilities. Uh, our research shows that on average, per person, it costs around £150,000 to provide that accommodation, and and sometimes even more. I went to a fantastic new scheme uh, recently in Bristol. You know, the, the costs that went into that scheme were into the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. But that person is currently living in a hospital, one of the hospitals that, uh, you know, gets, gets uh, you know, poor publicity around uh, mm -hmm. around the uh, the quality of the care uh, and the fact that they've been living there for, for far too long. So actually, by moving someone into accommodation that we can get housing benefit, because most of our tenants will claim housing benefit to pay, the commissioner pays the support very much tailored to their needs. Um, we, we've got clear evidence that um, it saves from thousands to at least hundreds of pounds per week to the public purse. So even if it's not an overall savings to the public purse, it means that they can then provide more accommodation as that, as I've said, that demand increases year on year. You know how how do you know what's working? How do you know yeah. that the impact on your tenants is is manifold in uh, in terms of welfare, well being, quality of life, life expectancy, ability to to function as freely as they can, but also the return on investment, you know, from the public purse and so on. So it sounds like you're quite a research led organisation. There's quite a lot of evidence building that you're doing. No, absolutely. Um... Certainly since 2013, 2014, when we started to do our first social impact bonds, part of that requirement of issuing bonds is actually to provide a, a, an annual social impact report to, to our investors. We, we publish it to, on our website widely. And when we started that process, what we got an independent organisation to come in and actually do some uh, in-depth uh, interviews with uh, individuals and their families six months after they've, they'd moved into accommodation that we'd bought. And the impact in terms of the tenants' well-being and the difference it had made to their lives in terms of their the changes from where they previously lived. Sometimes that was with with family members. Uh, sometimes that was in registered care. Sometimes it was in hospital settings. Their ability to access uh, community settings, the choice and control they had over um, their own health improvements. Um, but as I said earlier, I think one of the most biggest surprises for us was actually that the well-being on the mental health and, and physical health for family members mm -hmm. you know a big weight had been lifted off their shoulders uh and that was clear and we've been following that up over the years in terms of you know uh, analyzing the impact of, of people and we we and obviously uh commissioners uh regularly uh talk to tenants around the quality of the housing quality of the support things aren't right if people are unhappy 
how, how we can address that, making sure that the right level of support continues to go in. As I said, most of our tenants receive a high level of support. So probably less at risk to the certainly the cuts that have taken place over the last 10 years than perhaps other uh, groups who receive support. Um, but in terms of the financial impact, that that has been more uh, uh, tangible to to establish. We we um, worked with Mencap in 2018 to to produce a report around cost savings to to government uh, and the public purse on this area. And as I said, for some individuals, you're talking into the, the thousands a week savings, and at the very least, um, hundreds of pounds savings from from the previous inappropriate settings. Um, but there's only, as I said, it's only one part of it. The main thing is around the quality and, and the transformation it makes on their lives. When we arrange visits, uh, as I've done this week, to, to meet tenants, it's not easy because they've got busy lives. Yeah. You know, I'm speaking to, to yeah. two tenants this week and it's <laughs> literally, you know, I think that, that they, they had to cancel something for, to see me and then the rest, of the, they were doing stuff and they were proudly showing me. Um, one of them had been in the Special Olympics as a swimmer, another was performing in a in a in a community um uh sort of am dram production so so yeah it's, it's fantastic to see how busy you know the, the home for anybody is the foundations it is yeah. it's not the it's not the end of the it's not the end of the story it should be it should be uh, the, the foundations of building their lives in their communities and, and the theme i pick up you know we, we do lots of work collaborative work and and, and research as, as well as you know sort of communications with with a lot of charities or, or non-profit organizations that are really rooted in this idea of, of, of quality of life for 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 adults with 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 additional needs um but the thread that I hear a lot is you know this isn't about special this isn't about extraordinary this isn't about superpowers and all this kind of narrative actually what we're trying to do is create the most ordinary life yeah uh, and and the conditions where people can live you know, a completely boring existence in that they are doing absolutely the same mundane things that everybody else is doing. <laughs> um, you know, because they're because because actually, in the past, it's been a lot of um, you know the kind of idea of uh, this word special has been quite complicated and yeah. and and potentially loaded and and sometimes unhelpful uh, at yeah. worst harmful because actually this is just about you know making those small adjustments equipping people to be able to live as ordinary uh, a life as they they can that feels like a really sort of progressive thing that the that, that the society is is getting around whilst we speak now all the main political parties are going to be assembling their manifestos yeah. for election at some point within the next 12 to 18 months systemically housing and social care and and all the kind of broad parts of our society and our economy that and, and, and our and our policy making that that encompasses are seen as two pillars that that no government's got right you know yeah. probably since since the the second world war if you were writing or advising on some of those manifestos and, and you may well be i don't know but what would you like to see in there what do you think should change for me, it's, this isn't about more money. No. This is about using the money that we have better. And actually, I, I, I would argue probably in the end, use less money. Um, I mentioned, you know, the work that we do with our uh, housing network uh, peers, and that's at the moment we've got twenty-one housing associations uh, who, who've come together um, to develop best practice, to share kind of issues, um, respond to um, any any changes, um, and also sort of influence and campaign for change and but we knew whatever we said need to be need to be built on on real evidence and that's why we we've commissioned um research over the last uh nine months which we're publishing this uh summer uh that really sets out the picture of supported housing for people with disabilities but some key key recommendations for central and local government because whichever party is going to be in power in, in 18 months' time, um, they will need to have the right input from, you know, the, the civil servants within the Department of Leveling Up and the Department of Health and Social Care and, and, and various other departments that, that will support the, the you know, both the uh, policy development and, and how it's going to work on the ground. Uh, and and we, we have been working very closely 
in the last two or three years with with those teams for them to get better better understanding and and really i guess raise the profile around yes it's a it's a small part of the the entire social housing sector and in an element it's a it's a small part of the supported housing sector because older persons accommodation is is the largest but as i mentioned before six billion pounds of money goes into it you know we need and we've calculated that we're going to need over 300 million pounds a year of capital going in to provide the accommodation that's going to be needed that 1800 2000 people a year um which doesn't sound a big number but as i said you know potentially and as particular as costs of, of of land and building and 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 uh, property development goes up you could be looking at around about a third of a billion pounds a year mm-hmm. some of that needs to come more from from grant funding that already exists but we don't have access to that because of issues around ha- ha- what rents we can charge and um that does need to be addressed but actually private finance you know that social investment that we've tried to get more of in the last decade is desperately needed so my ask to govern is going to be and we're having conversations at the moment because obviously behind the scenes we're, we're talking about the, the research uh, findings and recommendations is um it, the government and our regulator has been very critical about some new entrants into the market who've been bringing in uh, private finance uh long-term leases it's been very you know very critical and and and, and in some cases the it's clear the quality and and the the business models haven't been right and and they're right to to question some of those but the reality is private finance is the only way we're going to solve this even even if we got all of the government grant funding that we should get each year i think that would only provide maximum of 10 to 15 percent of that you know 300 million pounds a year so it's embracing the right type of investment, making sure that there's, you know, there's, you know, people aren't exploiting the system. Because I think what we've seen, and the reason why there's been lots of issues, there was a Panorama program early in the year around one housing association uh, providing accommodation for people with learning disabilities and and people with mental health support needs, where it was argued that you know there was some governance issues, uh, you know, conflict of interest between the developers and the housing association very right to, to to focus and highlight where there are issues but the reasons why commissioners why families why individuals are going to providers perhaps who aren't uh meeting the requirements of government is because there's that huge huge need mm-hmm. so i would say firstly richard we need some funding both from government and from the private sector it needs to work but fundamentally and we've been saying this for many years and we've done you know work on the ground to, to support this it's more strategic planning. Mm-hmm. There's no national uh, strategic plans for, for, for supported housing and, and particularly for housing for people who learn disability. There's going to be a new private members bill that's going to be introduced this year um, that will look at uh, some more uh, standards and oversight and licensing of supported housing. And one of the key parts of that, that private members bill uh, is that uh, every uh, local authority should have a, a strategy for supporting its housing. Mm-hmm. You would have thought that would be fairly obvious already, but it doesn't. So what you tend to have is reactive, um, unplanned, uh, discoordinated um, provision. Um, people are doing fantastic work when they're asked to do it, but I think going forward, that that you know the right type of capital strategically spent is is mm-hmm. the approach that that any of the the the, the, the parties need to, to look at and and certainly we, we we're hoping to engage with the, both um the current government and uh and the shadow team uh, mm-hmm. over this year around our our recommendations yes uh, so much of what is obvious seems it, it often yes. ends up very very far away from from actual policy these yeah. days <laughs> but uh, but that that feels like a very clear proposition my final question and interpret this however you like uh what do you want golden lane housing to be famous for when you're not in the room what do you want people to be saying about the organization i think what we want to hear is that we're changing people's lives but far wider than just our our own properties our own tenants you know th- there's a limit to what how many people we can house each year and how much money we can raise and, and one of the things why i'm very proud to be chair of this this housing network is is the wider impact that the, the work of Golden Lane, the legacy that you know Mencap had 25 years ago, uh, when when we were set up as a separate charity at that time, Mencap said 
you work with other support and care providers because MENCAP obviously provide care and support uh, mm-hmm. to people, but work with others. So we work with, you know, the National Autistic Society, um, regional, local, people who've got their individualised budget and they they recruit their own team. So it's always been a, a vision for Golden Learn Housing and for me to, to have that wider impact so that, frankly, when listeners today are driving down um, their street, they may well be driving past a Golden Lane housing tenant or uh, another of our members' houses. They wouldn't necessarily know. In fact, they won't know because in fact, it should be an ordinary house in ordinary street. Um, yes, there might be some adaptations that you, if you look closely. Yes, oh, it's got level access or it's got maybe some additional parking because of, that's been provided for support mm-hmm. who, who support them. But actually, my hope would be that going forward, more and more people uh, have some of the learned disabilities living in their street, it's part of their communities, uh, part of their their church or their you know, their local uh, kind of drama club, and in a sense, it becomes more normal f- uh, growing up for new for children in this society. But it's you know, whereas perhaps when I was growing up in you know 30, 40 years ago as a as a, as a young teenager, I, I didn't come across people with a learned disability. They would have been living. I'm originally from Swansea. They're likely to be living in a in a in a hospital on the hill. Kept with away. This, this special sort of word, yes, uh, 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 wrapped around them in a in a in a harmful way. Um, John, I think the work you're doing is extraordinary, and uh, uh, all power to you. Thank you for being a guest on the Possibility Club. Absolute pleasure, Richard. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Possibility Club Practical Bravery. If you enjoyed this episode, do like, share, review, tell everybody about it. Look in the show notes for all the details of today's guest, stuff we talked about, stuff that's of interest, new things to read, new things to listen to. And if you are running a business or a charity and you are trying to accelerate or improve the impact that you have in the world, if you want to be famous for what you do and what you change rather than just what you sell, then talk to us alwayspossible.co.uk We want to hear from you, we want to talk to you, we want to amplify and elevate your ideas, and who knows, we might be able to help you feel more confident and clear about what's next. alwayspossible.co.uk We'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new special guest and a new insight on practical bravery in action. The Possibility Club is an always possible podcast. The interviewer was Richard Freeman for Always Possible and the producer and editor was me, Chris Thorpe Tracy, for Lo-Fi Arts. Have a good week. Alwayspossible.co.uk Lo-Fi Arts <laughs>